The Bible says this, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines saying, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees. So you got to be careful when you go to sleep. And she called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and I will shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. Verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. I want to read that verse one more time. I think it's a beautiful verse, significant verse. And if you have a Bible, a highlighter, a pen, a crayon, underline that. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. What a beautiful picture, I think, of God's grace and God's mercy. Over the next uh, few moments together, as we've worshiped together, we're going to read God's word and listen to God's word and look at Jesus today through the story of Samson. I, I want God to speak to us. If you're taking notes, uh, today I've titled this message, It's Time to Grow Again. It's time to grow again. Why don't you high five three, four people around you, look at them in their eyes and tell them it's time to grow again. Tell somebody, it's time to grow again. It's time to grow again. Let us pray, and then we'll talk about Samson and uh, all that God has. Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for this morning. What a beautiful morning full of new grace, full of new compassions, new mercies. God, we're so thankful that you've been so good to us. Uh, we thank you for all that you have done in this church. We thank you for the good fathers in this house. God, I'm praying that you continue to strengthen them, cover them, protect them. I'm praying that your grace and your mercy would help them and comfort them and lift them up, God. And I'm praying that uh, they would recover from whatever they think they've lacked. And I'll be able, and today be able to be all that you've called them to be in Jesus' name. And I'm praying for more good fathers, spiritual fathers, physical fathers, uh, to be lifted up in our communities, God, because we need good mentors and people that we can look up to. And so I pray a special blessing today over every single father. God, that you are enough for them. And if you're for them, nothing could be against them all the days of their life. Thank you for today. Holy Spirit, speak to our lives. Open up our eyes. Let us see you and know you better. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that all of God's people say. Oh, come on. All of God's people say. Can you make some noise for Jesus one more time? Come on. Many years ago, the incredible famous artist Pablo Picasso uh, had this one particular painting that he did uh, that became known as The Dream, The Dream. It was a very famous painting uh, sold for millions of dollars. In fact, the first original owner that bought it, uh, his name was Mr. Wynn, Steve Wynn, I believe, uh, owner of the Wynn at Las Vegas. And when he bought it, he was proud of this painting. He was excited that he purchased this painting, and he would display it often in his hotel in Vegas, in his offices. He, he was excited that to finally own this piece of art. He had this man come up to him, another incredible businessman. Uh, they were friends, and he said, I will purchase this uh, piece of art from you. And they agreed to make the deal. As Mr. Wynn was getting ready to sell it, he thought, I'm going to have one last party, and he showed off the painting to several friends before the sale went through. And that day, he kept backing up a little bit. He has an eye disease that doesn't let him focus too well on his surroundings. And by mistake, as he was making some movements with his arms, he put his elbow right through the dream and completely ripped apart this painting that's cost millions and millions of dollars. Obviously, the sale didn't go through, and Mr. Wynn had to start contacting people on who could repair a painting like this. After several months and a whole lot of work and restoration, the painting was fixed. And they said, if you looked at this painting, you would never have imagined it was once torn or ripped. It was absolutely perfect. The restoration was absolutely beautiful. They did such a perfect work on this painting that you and I would have never guessed 
this thing had an elbow go right through it. In fact, the guy who wanted to buy it about a year or two before came back to see it, saw it, and said, no, this is absolutely beautiful. It's been restored. Never could I have imagined it was ripped. I want to buy it again. He was going to buy it for $135 million and decided I will give you $155 million and became one of the most expensive pieces ever sold. Have you ever felt like you put an elbow through your life? <laughs> have you ever felt like the painting of your life has been torn by bad decisions, things that we've done, things that we have said possibly? You ever said something and wish you can get it right back? Words that damage relationships, things that hurt people. I think all of us have one point or another, we put an elbow through our life, through the painting that God is trying to put together. We, we damaged it. We've ruined it. We've made poor choices. We've done things that we're not proud of. And in fact, in this room, we, we probably wouldn't even tell half the people half the things we've done in our life because some of them we're not proud of. We've, we've, we've been some places and, and done some things that today... You know, if you're honest, you're actually ashamed of. There's been moments in my life where I've ripped the painting of my life, put an elbow right through it, and it leaves you feeling defeated. A failure in life, a mistake in life, a bad decision, and sometimes it seems like it's decision after decision, and I can't get one right. You ever been there? And it's like, my God, I can't get one right. It's been bad decisions. It's... Uh, Perhaps another night where you consume alcohol to forget your pain only to end up in a place where you don't want to be. Ever been there? On the other side of a divorce and you're not really happy because the dream that you once had has been torn. Put our elbows through life and made a decision and started an affair and betrayed the spouse and the kids or the husband. I think all of us at one point, one decision or another, we put our elbows through life and we've ripped the painting that God has wanted to make. Every single one of us, we made decisions. We say something. We've hurt people. We've hurt ourselves. Have you ever sabotaged your own life? Because you don't believe you deserve all that God is trying to give you. And so we end up ruining the painting that God has. Where, where do you go after that? What's your outlook on failure? What's your, what's your perspective on loss? When you've made a mistake, when you've hurt people, when you've damaged relationships, when you're on the other side of an embarrassing moment or a shameful moment or a moment full of guilt, what is your outlook? Because that determines a whole lot of what is going to happen for the rest of your life. You and I are perspective on what happens this moment that tried to define me, this moment where I fell down, this moment where I slipped, this moment that I'm not proud of. How I look at that can determine what happens next in my life. In fact, I put it this way, your attitude determines your altitude. And I think many of us, we've heard that all throughout our life, but I think that is absolutely true. Your attitude toward defeat, your attitude toward a loss, your attitude toward a failure. Do you keep on looking down with your head down saying, I'll never recover, I'll never be able to get up again? Or do you believe that there really is a God, the God that we say that we worship? And can I tell you, he's better than any painter, any restorer here on earth. He's the ultimate restorer. He's the ultimate one that can renovate, that can make new. Come on, he's a healer. He's the one that can come into our lives and make it all brand new again. Somebody will look at your life and say, I never knew they went through that. I never knew they went down. I never knew they had a failure because he is a good God. He's an awesome God. And you can come out better than how you were before. Do I have a witness in this place? Give God some praise. Come on. Today, you need to change the outlook on your life and say, it's time to stand again. It's time to believe again. I might have failed, but I'll get up again. I might have been a failure, but I'm not a failure anymore. I made a mistake, but I'm a new man. I'm a new woman. Come on, in Jesus' name, it's time to be strong again. It's time to pray again. It's time to worship again. It's time to grow again. Somebody say, grow again. Come on, we're people of faith. Can I get an amen? I put it this way, the future of faith is greater than the failures of the past. Oh, come on, people of faith, we look forward into the future and we realize that with faith, our future is better than our past. Can I get an amen? 
It does not matter what has happened in your past. The devil is a liar. I came to prophesy to somebody that your latter days will be greater than your former days. Oh, come on. The latter glory of your life will be greater than the former glory. My best days are ahead of me. I'm walking in my glory days. Oh, there's a God that goes before me, behind me, and surrounds me. I will not stay down and out. I will stand and believe that God is for me. Can I get an amen? And if you're not careful, the enemy will lie and say, you're done. Your best days are behind you. But people of faith, we look through faith, believe through faith, stand through faith, worship through faith, pray through faith. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking at my future and it looks way better than my past. Samson is a man who put an elbow multiple times through the painting of his life. We've been reading through the book of Judges and man, these are some messed up people. If you've been here for the past five weeks, this book is disheartening. It is actually depressing. And so I'm glad we've been reading it. But the reason we read it is because we're trying to learn from the past because if not, we're bound to repeat the past. And so the people of God, God is trying to rule over them and help them, but they keep on failing. They keep on rebelling. They don't want God to rule over them. And so God has to raise up judges. And we get to about chapter 13 in the book of Judges, and we read about this new judge, this new deliverer named Samson. One more time, can you say Samson? Come on, can you say it stronger like he was the strongest man that ever lived? Say Samson. Samson is going to be not just any deliverer, not just any judge, not just any helper or savior. He's a special child. The Bible says that there's something special about Samson, and he actually has a very special announcement as he's getting ready to be conceived and to be born. An angel appears to his parents. Isn't that significant? Because the same thing happened with Jesus. And so this tells us this isn't just any deliverer. There's something different about this deliverer because he has an angel pronounced his birth. I know you think you're special, but I don't think an angel pronounced your birth. And so an angel appears to his parents. And, and I know we read chapter 16, but if we can go back a couple chapters, look at chapter 13 and look what the angel tells his parents. 13 verse 5, it says, you're going to become pregnant and have a son. You must never cut his hair because it says this boy will be a Nazarite dedicated to God from birth. He'll begin to rescue Israel from the power of the Philistines. Now, if you go back and remember the last several weeks we've talked about the people of God, when they rebel against God, they end up being enslaved. They're living in the promised land, but they're enslaved by all these enemies because they keep on disobeying God. God's like, if you obey me, you'll have freedom and blessings. But if you disobey me, you're going to run into problem. The Jebusites enslaved them. The Ammonites, the parasites, literally the termites, mosquito bites, everybody. And now it's the Philistines that are overpowering them. The Bible says by this time, it's been 40 years. Somebody say 40. For 40 years, they've been oppressed, held down, slaves again. And some of us can relate to that because this is our life. We get free. God does something in our life only to end up back in sin and back in slavery. And he frees us, and yet we keep going back to the same thing that God delivered us from. And we end up oppressed with a foot on our neck by the enemy. And we can't get free. We can't enjoy all that God has for us because we're trapped in this cycle of dysfunction. That's the people of God in the book of Judges. And so the angel says, it's your son that's going to deliver the people of God from the Philistines. After 40 years of slavery, and his name is Samson. Now, we just read, the angel said he's going to take a Nazarite vow. If you don't know what that is, if you go read in the Old Testament, there were several men in that took this vow, and literally it was a vow where they would separate themselves for a special calling. And the sign of a Nazarite was that they were never to cut their hair. And some of the things that they had to do was, for example, not to drink wine or touch any fruit of the, of the vine. Uh, you couldn't drink a strong drink. There were several things they couldn't eat or drink uh, because they, they were separated for a special calling over their life. You're a Nazarite. Now, God has a special calling over your life. You can't do what everybody else is doing. Samson, I've set you apart because there's a calling over your life. You're going to free the people of God. You can't go where everybody else is going. You can't laugh at what everybody else is laughing at. And, and you can't touch dead corpses. And that was the vow over Samson's life because God had a specific calling over his life to free the people of God. 
as we're going through Judges 13 through 16 this week in our study guides, and we're looking at Samson's life, I think one of the things that we can learn about and really apply to our own life, number one, is the art of consecration. Somebody say consecration. Consecration, what does this word mean? This word literally means to be set apart, apart for a specific purpose and calling in life. In other words, consecration means you are going to be separated from everybody else because there is a specific calling and purpose for your life. To consecrate yourself, to be holy. Holy sometimes we think is to just do something weird or whatever. Holy just means set apart. If we were to have 10 people up here, you grab one and you set them apart, that means that person is now holy, set apart, about, consecrated for a specific task. Samson was to be holy, separated, there was a vow. And I think you and I can learn today that when you consecrate yourself to something, there is strength in that devotion that you consecrate, consecrate yourself to. Many people say, what was the secret of Samson's strength? Was it that he went to the gym 24-7? Was Ulysses his coach? I don't understand. What made Samson strong? Was it his long hair? Can I tell you, it was none of that. It was a vow that he made to God. I'll serve you and love you and I'll worship you all the days to my, of my life. I won't look to the right. I won't look to the left, but I'll hold, be holy and devoted to God. And can I, can I tell you today, that's not just for Samson, that's for you and I. Every child of God should be consecrated to God. You and I today, that just means we shouldn't be doing what everybody else is doing. You can't laugh at what everybody else is laughing about. You can't go where everybody else is going because there's something different about us. We are children of the almighty living God and there's a special calling on our lives for such a time as this. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're on Dream Team, whether you're a businessman or a businesswoman, God God wants to do something in and through your life. Can you consecrate yourself to him? To say, God, I'm going to be set apart. I am going to separate myself from the rest. And the problem that we're having today is that the church looks just like the world. And we act like the world and we laugh like the world and we drink like the world and we behave like the world. And that's why there is no difference. I want to talk to some difference makers that say there's something different about me. When I met Jesus, he did something in my life. I used to be a drunk, but now he found me. I used to be blind, but now I see. I used to rage and anger, but now I have peace. I used to be confused, but now I have direction. Where are the difference makers that say I can't act the way everybody else acts? I can't behave the way way everybody else behaves. Come on, there's some difference makers in this church that said I was born to be a leader. Can I get an amen? amen. Samson, you're supposed to be consecrated, set apart. You can't do what everybody else is doing. I want you to hear me out. I'm not talking about legalism. That's, some of us came from those circles. We grew up in churches like that. I'm talking about just living different, being different. Look what Paul writes to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, I'll make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and then I'll welcome you, and I'll be a father to you, and you'll be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. In other words, God is saying, you can't just go and play around with sin like everybody else. Come on, there's something different about a Christian. There's something different about a believer. We talk different. You can't just use the words that everybody else is using. You can't just laugh at the same jokes that everybody else is laughing at. Come on, where are the consecrated men? I believe that God wants to raise up a generation of new leaders, men and women of God. And where you'll get your strength from is not from your physical strength, but from your spiritual strength when you devote yourself to the Lord. There's something powerful about devotion when you give yourself to this one thing. You look at any athlete that has been great, it's because they devoted themselves to that one thing. Tom Brady, who just had his Hall of Fame ceremony, said, oh, for me, it was different. When everybody else was eating pancakes, I had to be in the gym working out. When everybody else was playing around, I had to be on the field doing two-a-days. And he says, there was not my talent, it was not my abilities that made me who I was. It was my hard work, commitment, and dedication, and you can do it too. And if a man can be great when he commits his life to a secular thing, how much greater can you be when you commit your life to a living God? When you say, I give my life to this almighty God. God, if you would use me, I place my hands. I place my life in your hands. I give you my talent, my mind, my business, my abilities. Come on, when you put your life in the hands of almighty God and you say, 
I'll separate myself from everything else. God will use you and make you a difference maker is the art of consecration. How do we get Christianity today? How do we get to where we are today? It's by men and women of God that were not afraid to look like fools in the eyes of the world. Some of them were sawn in two. Some of them were killed with a sword. Some of them crucified upside down. It was men and women of God that said, slay me if you have to. They got on boats and on cars and went to the middles of the jungle to preach the gospel. Charles Spurgeon said, some of them walked through mud and if happy, they would walk with blood because they were, they were just infected with a consecration to serve the Lord. I got this passion in me. God, I give you my life. I give you my voice. I give you my hands. I give you my feet. I give you all of me. Use my money, my talent, my time. Where are the consecrated men and women of God today that says, God, use me? That's how Christianity kept going by men and women of God that says, I count it all our loss, but to know him in the power of his resurrection. Where are the men and women of God today that says, I count it all loss, but to know him. Joshua told the people of God, consecrate yourself today because tomorrow God will do wonders among you. Sometimes we want the wonders without the consecration, but you can't have wonders without consecration. God, I don't care about none of this world, but I just want to serve you. And love you all the days of my life. America has seen its share of great revivals. And we've seen this country turn around and seen God do mighty things in our country. I'm thankful for this country. Anybody else? I'm grateful to be living in the best country in the world. And the gospel started spreading all throughout this country when men and women of God stood up and weren't ashamed. And they devoted themselves. In the 1700s, we had our first great awakening. And it was Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield that started preaching in public places. And people would come in droves to hear these men. And revival swept across our land and all the colonies in the 1700s. And everybody was going to church. The second great awakening came with Charles Finney. And, and that just literally caused revival. And D.L. Moody, and they were preaching all the major cities of our country. And men and women would come rushing, repenting because they needed Jesus. Because there was men and women of God who were consecrated and said, God, use me. I'll be a voice in this country to turn people back to you. Far from perfect, but they serve the perfect God. And then we got Billy Sunday. And we got great evangelists. We got the Jesus movement in the 70s with Chuck Smith, where all these hippies turned back to Jesus because it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, big, skinny, tall, short. God wants to call everybody from every ethnic group, from every background and say, there's one way. His name is Jesus. Today, if you turn to him, he'll turn your life around, and it does not matter where you come from. From Billy Graham to Catherine Kuhlman, we need men and women of God to say, Lord, use me. I want to be consecrated for your work. Come on, can I get an amen? Amen. Today, God is looking at our church and saying, where are the people that would separate themselves from the pack and give your life to Jesus? Samson was supposed to be it. But again, as we said, your attitude determines your altitude. He had a poor attitude toward his calling. He treated his calling with contentment. He, he, he treated it casually. You were supposed to be a judge, a deliverer, and here you are playing with sin, Samson. Samson, you did not know the great calling that was over your life, and you just wasted your years, never reaching the full potential of all that God wanted to do with your life. How sad it would be to reach the end of our life and never reach the full potential of all that God wanted to do. Samson, somebody shout Samson. The Bible says one day he's walking with his parents, and a, a lion jumps out, and he grabs the lion, and he tears the lion apart with his bare hands. Other than me and Ulysses, I don't know who else can do that. It was powerful. <laughs> Remember that day? <laughs> the Bible says the lion is dead for a few days, and on the way back home, he sees that bees have made honey inside the dead carcass, and he touches the lion and the honey. He's a, he's a Nazarite. He's not supposed to do that. But when you treat what God is doing with your life casually, you start putting your hands and taking your feet to places you shouldn't go. And touching things you shouldn't touch. Am I talking to somebody? And we treat our lives casually as if there's not a great call over our life. Oh, Samson, Samson, what are you doing? Samson, you're messing up the vow and the calling that God had for your life. But God is so good and so gracious. And always gives you another chance. Somebody say another chance. And what Samson did not know was that you needed to be prepared. Number one, the art of consecration. Number two, the importance of preparation. 
Somebody say preparation. Preparation for what? I feel like maybe some of us, I've lived this way at times, we're unaware that there's a real enemy that wants to destroy our lives. There's a real enemy that wants to destroy every good thing that God wants to do in your life because he hates God and he sees God in you. So he wants to destroy anything that you are trying to build or God is trying to build through you. So he'll come and he'll destroy relationships and marriages and homes and churches and lives because he does not want you to reach your full potential. And if you are not prepared, you will fall when the enemy comes. Samson, where are your friends that were supposed to be there to tell you, don't you touch that dead lion? Where are his people that were supposed to be his accountability partners helping him out? He was not prepared. Somebody say prepared. Are you prepared for everything the enemy wants to do in your life? I'm not talking about living in fear. I'm talking about living in faith. I need some brothers and some sisters next to me. I need my heart prepared, my mind prepared. I can't just live in la-la land like there's not a real lion out to destroy my life. I got to live focused. I got to live by faith that God has a great calling over my life, over my business, over my marriage, over my family. Come on, greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. We need some soldiers that are prepared for battle that you stand in action and you say God I am living ready so I never have to get ready come on somebody but if you're not prepared anything the enemy throws your way you will bite ah. <laughs> the Bible literally says he throws bait your way that's literally the, the wording he lures you away that's what the Bible says how often have we been lured away to bad decisions you got to be prepared somebody say prepared Paul Possibly the greatest evangelist of all time, other than Jesus, Paul, who God saves on the road to Damascus, is building churches. He's doing incredible work in the ancient world, very well known. He knows the devil is after him. Because when you switch from team Satan to team Jesus, you better believe every demon in hell has a target on your back. And Paul, he's aware of this, and he tells the church in Ephesus, all the way at the end in chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, he says, finally, be strong. Somebody say strong. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Oh, Paul says, you better stand strong. Because there's a real devil, a real enemy that wants to destroy your future. And so you better stand strong and put on the whole armor of God that you may stand. Somebody say stand. You got to be prepared so that when the enemy comes your way with temptation, you say, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I got a future. I got a calling. I got an anointing. I got the Holy Spirit. I got a family. I got a wife. I got a husband. I got kids. There's a God that is with me. I will not follow the Lord. But you got to be prepared. Put on the whole armor of God. In one of his other letters, he says, oh, we knew of the devil's designs. Do you know how the devil comes to get you do you know the design after your life he knows your weak area and in your weak area is where he's going to tempt you the most you ever go somewhere and you're like hmm this is funny I got all this temptation in this same area it's the devil he knows where the temptation is and we got to be prepared for temptation the Bible says resist temptation it says to flee the enemy I heard one preacher one time say it's the greatest line. I love it when it comes to temptation. It is better to eliminate a temptation than to resist a temptation. Why resist a temptation for the rest of your life when you have the power to eliminate it? I'll give an example. You guys know my war with pita chips. I can either open my, my pantry and resist it for the next five years to try to keep this six-pack and this cut... Or I can just throw them away in the garbage and I no longer have to resist because I eliminate it. What can you eliminate from your life to prepare you for all that God has for you? Come on, there's some things in our life we just got to eliminate. I'm just better without it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm just better without it. You keep reading Ephesians chapter 6, a couple of verses down in verse 16, he says, And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. That gives you a picture. There's... There's literally a demonic assignment over our lives. There's, there's demons everywhere. And I know it sounds funny, but they are throwing darts your way. 
And you know when it's the enemy. Because now that you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Anybody thankful for the Holy Spirit? Oh, before you met Jesus, you were at La Covacha till 5, 6 a.m., one night stands, a bunch of drunken nights. You didn't feel anything. Oh, what a night. <laughs> oh, what a night. <laughs> but since you got saved, you ever go to do something and you just feel the Holy Spirit like, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. Hey, put up your shield of faith. There's a calling over your life. I don't know who this is for, but I'm here to prophesy over you in Jesus' name. Your latter days will be better than your former days. Put up the shield of faith. You can be prepared. You can be consecrated. There's a calling. There's an anointing. You will build a great family. You can be that businessman or businesswoman. You can make a difference in today's society. Oh, come on, be prepared. I'm consecrated and prepared in Jesus' name. Samson, Samson, Samson treated his calling lightly, touched the dead lion, and then started messing around with messy women. Three different women that he went after. The Bible says, and then Samson went down to Timnah. You got to read chapters 13 through 16. See, whenever, whenever you treat what God is doing in your life casually, you always go down. You always go down. Some of us, we've been going down because we treat what God has done in our life casually. Yeah, I know Jesus, I'm saved, but I can, I can, I can go down. Go down. He went down to Timnah and he messed around with wrong women who came into his life to destroy him. And he started messing around with women he wasn't supposed to mess around with. The Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. He was mixing up his faith with women who served other false gods. And what they did in their religions were absolutely disgusting, abhorrent. And yet Samson went, and because he was led by the eyes and not by the spirit, he messed around with them. One and two, literally prostitutes. You got to read the book of Judges. We get to the last one, and because of time, I have to hurry up. But we get to the last one, and it's Delilah. Oh, Delilah. Somebody say Delilah. Sweet to the eyes, bitter to the soul. Many believe she was a Philistine. She, she was not the one you were supposed to go out with, sleep with, marry. And yet Samson is led by the eyes. He's in love with her. Isn't it crazy? The, the name Samson means little son. He was supposed to be a ray of light for the people of God. The name Delilah means delicate night. Isn't there a verse that says, what business does light have to do with darkness? And yet he goes and he spends some nights with Delilah. And she's like, where, where does your strength come from? And he confuses her several times. And How dumb do you have to be that you tell this woman your whole heart? Well, it's because I'm consecrated to God. It's represented in my hair. If I cut my hair, I lose my strength finally. The Bible says she vexed him. It literally means she wore him down. Tell me, Samson. Tell, she was nagging. Tell me, tell me. Come on, Sam. You don't love me. Tell me. What's your strength? So she had him annoyed, weary, and tired. That's how the enemy comes into our life. He will wear us down. You think you're strong enough. Listen, without the Holy Spirit, you will never be able to. It will wear you down. It vexes you. And we got to Judges chapter 16, verses 9 through 21, where he told her. And there we read that she got him to fall asleep with his head on her lap. Be careful where you put your head. Be careful where you lay your head to sleep. What I mean is spiritually speaking, where you go to find some rest, where you go to speak to somebody. Oh, it's the art of consecration. It's also the importance of preparation. I can't just go anywhere. I can't just hang with the people I used to hang with. I can't just laugh at some jokes. I can't just go where I got to. Anybody with me? Anybody understand what I'm talking about? They cut his hair. She warns him, the Philistines are coming upon you. And Samson wakes up and thinks he's going to defeat him like he did time and time again. But this time, the Lord had left him. And the Bible says, and we just read verses 20 and 21, that they grabbed him, they bound him, they gouged out his eyes, he took him down to the prison where he was grinding in the mill for the rest of his life. Kavi, I want you to pay attention. We're about to close in just a few moments, but this is what sin does in your life. Sin will bind you, sin will blind you, and sin will grind you down. We think we're strong enough. I can do it. I, I'm good. I'm good. I can still hang around the same store. I can do whatever I want to do Monday through Saturday. It will bind you. Sooner or later, you'll be bound by this sin. 
and it'll become a trap, whether it's a mentality, a thought, an action, an addiction, a vice. Sooner or later, sin will bind you. Then it will come and it will blind you. I've talked to people where I'm like, hey, please, just like stop doing what you're doing. You don't want to continue. But they're so blind. You ever talk to somebody that's so blind that it's like, oh, I'm good. No, you're not seeing that sin comes to gouge out your eyes. And then it will grind you down, wear you down. Samson is a shell of himself in prison for the rest of his life. Samson, great Samson, the great deliverer, the light, the judge, is now in a prison, and he's half the man that he used to be. The Philistines laugh at him. The enemy ridicules him. But there in that dark place, in that prison cell, in that lonely place, probably full of embarrassment, probably full of guilt and shame because he had failed time and time again. What we pick up from the story is that Samson turned to the Lord once again. Because in chapter 16, verse 22, it says, but his hair started to grow back as soon as it was shaved off. The the hair was significant of his vow, his commitment, his consecration. I can imagine him in that cell every day as they would bring him out to grind at the mill. He would start worshiping once again. He'll start turning to the Lord once again and say, God, forgive me for everything that I did. God, forgive me for some of my poor choices. I went down to Timnah. God, forgive me for touching the carcass of a dead lion. God, forgive me because I took your calling casually. God, forgive me because I I was so stubborn and arrogant and I thought I was strong and I thought that it was my strength. God, forgive me. And I can picture Samson with tears coming down his eyes. Asking God for forgiveness and little by little his hair started to grow again because we serve the God of once again. We serve the God that always gives you another chance. I've heard before that God is a God of second chances. I came to tell you more than a second chance. He's the God of another chance. He's the God of another chance. Today, if you failed, if you've fallen, I'm here to tell you he's the God of another chance. And if you call on him today, and if you run to him today, he'll restore you. He'll lift you up. Don't let shame and failure bring you down. In Jesus' name, you get back up and fight again. You get back up and believe again. You get back up and worship again. We serve the God of once again. It's time to grow again. The Bible says that Samson one day goes out. They bring him out for entertainment at this big party. He's blind. The boy has to lead him and there's more details there. You got to go read it. It's a beautiful story. And Samson had been there before. It's the temple of Dagon. All the Philistines are celebrating and he says, put my hands on the pillar. I've seen this temple before. I've been here. And he puts his hands on the pillar. And you've seen it. You've seen Veggie Tales. He pushes the pillars down. And as he pushes the pillars down, all the Philistines come crumbling down. And that day he kills 3,000 Philistines, more than he ever did in his life. Because your best days are not behind you, but before you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Samson, I told you that the book of Judges is all pointing to the greater Savior named Jesus. Samson has a birth like Jesus where it's announced by an angel. Samson is betrayed by a woman the same way Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And Jesus was also in a dungeon where it looked like the enemy was celebrating. It was called the grave. And it looked like Jesus was down and out and all of hell was celebrating until the third day. Oh, come on. It's time to get up again. It's time to grow again. It's time to stand again. And the Bible says blood came flowing again. Life came flowing again. And on the third, on the third, Jesus, he got up from the grave. He kicked the door down and he walked out. We have a risen Savior. We have a God of again, again, again. That Jesus, come on. Today, if you call on him, he'll restore your life again. Can I tell you? God can restore a painting again. God can lift up a man of God again, a woman of God again. God can do it to a painting, God can do it to a life, cause it to grow again, believe again, stand again. And he can also cause a church to grow again. 
Today we have a very special announcement that we're really excited about because God has been so faithful for this church, to this church for 24 years. And um, there were some days when this church looked like it was down and out. Some of you were here eight years ago through a transition and anybody could have seen us and started to count one, two, three. It looked like we were out down to five dollars at the bank. And, and over the last eight years, we've seen God just do amazing things. Especially the last two, it's just been exponential growth and craziness. And I just believe that's the Spirit of God that says it's time to grow again. It's time to stand again. It's time to make a difference in society again. And it's been awesome to see. It's been awesome to see all of God's goodness and all of God's grace. As many of you know, the last two years, we literally don't know what else to do. In this building, we pack it out four times. Any big event on a Sunday, we're out of space. Earlier this year, we're like, let's go to four services. And it's been awesome. It's alleviated a little bit, the parking and the kids. But I get it. I know it's not the most comfortable position. I don't know how people keep coming. I know it's tight. We have the smallest chairs of any church in the universe. And we're just trying to make it happen. And went to four services. And still growth keeps happening. This is year is going to be our biggest harvest year ever. It's been absolutely crazy. And so, like, okay, God, what do we do? Like, another announcement. We're adding a fifth service. No, God, no. Like, we don't know. Lord, what can we do? So for the past two years, we've been looking um, for just a property. We've been looking for a property where we can build a future church, hopefully over 1,500 seats, something that we can do to help. And the past two years, I mean, people have called all kind of help, all kind of realtors. And if it wasn't out in the Everglades, it was down in Key Largo. If it wasn't Key Largo, it was up in Lakeland. And I'm like, we're, we're in Kendall. I don't know. God help us. And about three months ago, we got a phone call. And uh, I want to thank Rob, our realtor, him and his wife, Renata, are absolutely gold and amazing. And he's been working, I'm talking about, he's been working around the clock. He doesn't sleep. And maybe you're like, oh yeah, great for a commission. He says, from day one, he says, by the way, I don't want a commission. God has blessed me. I want nothing. I'm here to serve the church. It's been absolutely crazy. And um, he called us. Rob, I love you. He's in Brazil right now with his family. Rob, I love you with all my heart. Thankful for you, Renata, your entire family. Thank you for being absolutely incredible. And thank you for all that you've done. He called us about three months ago, went to go see this property, and I'm just going to get to it today. Uh, I just want to say Calvary has a new home. We have found our new home. God has been good. Come on, he's a good guy. been a while three three months ago we literally went running we went to go see this property Coyaso texted us I want to thank God for Coyaso who's also been working I mean just absolutely insane he's one of our executive pastors he's our CFO and he's like hey are you ready to go see your property now 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 get in a car everybody goes running I want to thank our board members Eunice who's here has been absolutely incredible Adit who's here has been absolutely phenomenal and we've gotten We've gotten help from so many people. We go see the property, and it is seven acres. And so we are going to be building our future building on those seven acres. By the way, we bought it cash and closed on it two weeks ago. So now here's the thing. On top of that, when we got there, not only could we build a future building, it already had a building we can use. And so we walk in, there's an old Baptist church, and we see a little place where they were meeting that holds about 300, 400 people. We're like, all right, this is good, but it's too small. We, we could definitely build in the back, but what do we do here? And then we walk into this ginormous gym that this church had. And we're like, when you got eyes with vision, come on, you're like, oh, we can turn this gym into a full Pentecostal Sunday serve. <laughs> we can put over 800 chairs in our brand new auditorium. And so, Possibly 900 and, and so so we're gonna start with two services there and a lot of space bigger chairs in Jesus name finally bigger chairs um, Now now I know maybe you may be thinking okay, but when when are we going by the way? This is in uh, horse country right on the edge of horse country next to sunset 12 minutes from here um, Three minutes from Kendall Drive. It is the location is at, I'm telling you we went to the Everglades to look at property We went to get one in the heart of Kendall it is only, only God. Only God. Only God. 
And so, when you leave church now, you're going to have more options than just Chili's. Anybody thankful for that? Come on, it's good. All of Kendall Drive. Uh, maybe you're like, okay, wh but when do we go? This is awesome. Can I tell you already? We had to tell a handful of people, obviously, because of everything that it took to close. And already, demolition is happening. Already, renovation is happening. A team of people, Eddie and his entire crew. I saw Eddie a little while ago, and his entire have been painting, renovating. There's a ton. Of, the rain has stopped the painting, but we wanted the video to show the paint, the church painted. But rain has been absolutely incredible. We're gonna get it done. But here's the thing: when are we moving in? Well, many of you know. We, we talked about conference all year long. We announced it at Easter. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I had conference in my heart for the past about three, four years. And every year I was like, no, there's nothing here. No, there's nothing here. Finally, I said this year, let's do it. And we, the, the executive team said, let's do it. Where are we going to do it? We don't know. We don't know. We literally thought, okay, we're going to do it at the school. That's it. We talked to the school. The school said, yeah, you have these five nights, five night revival at the school. And all of a sudden, this opened where we can put 900 chairs in a brand new location. We are moving this September with a grand opening celebration week. Come on, take off beyond. Let's go celebrate all that God has done. Let's go. I'm going to ask my wife, Diana, to come join me. Yeah, yeah, you know we throw a party. We're throwing a week-long party for this one. And so we're going to be out there. We're going to be out there every night from the 24th to the 29th. You need to register now. we got 90 days to turn this building around, and we're doing it. We are flying. We're doing everything we can so that it's ready. That first night of conference is going to be our first night in that building celebrating all that God has done. So we're throwing a week-long party, and we're just grateful. We are so grateful, and to you as well. You know, it's been a journey of you've been here for however long you've been, you know that this has been a prayer in our hearts and that a time it may have seemed like it was so far away, but I love that God's timing really is perfect because like Alex mentioned, it's not just that we have a property where we're going to now be able to build our building how we want it, how we've dreamt it, but the fact that now we're also able to move there with bigger space in the meantime so we don't even have to stay here tight. And so I'm just grateful because this is not just about a person. This is not just about one name, but this really is about all of us as a family. Like we always say, it's us together. It's our win together. It's our sacrifice together. And as I look around this room, I know it is because of the prayers of all of us together, the faith of all of us, the, the time and service that we have all spent. God sees that and God honors that. And so I'm excited for a new season. And our faith doesn't stop here. It brought us here. But now it's even bigger and stronger and better and greater as we move forward and continue to do incredible things in the name of Jesus. I really believe, guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is only the beginning. I have faith that one day we're going to buy multiple properties, multiple buildings. We're just getting started. If in the last eight years we've been able to bless Miami with over $1.6 billion, helping out low-income families, broken families, I'm talking about we've covered hospital, we've covered funeral, all that because of the giving of this church. How much more as we get stronger, bigger? In Jesus' name, we're going to make a difference in the city of Miami. Come on. I'm believing it. And so we got... We got 90 days to turn this around. There's a whole team that's working relentlessly. Um, I know every week for the past two years, I've had a bunch of people come up to me outside. Hey, I'm a contractor. Hey, I can do this. Hey, I'm an electrician. Okay, now's the time. Um, so we're going to put up some information on the screen. If there's any help that you can give us, anything, maybe you got any kind of connections. For example, the patio that we have here, we're trying to do that patio two times the size over there. Turf alone, as many of you know, that turf is expensive. And so imagine that twice as big. But we're going to do it. We're going to make it happen. It's going to cost us almost a million dollars to renovate this building in the next 90 days, and we are doing it in Jesus' name. We're going to do it. We're going to be there September 24th. And so I'm telling you, if you, any connections, if you're a permit runner, if you have connections in the county, if you have any kind of equipment, resources, anything you want to do, if you want to give toward our million dollar renovation, whatever it is, we would just welcome it. All the information is on the screen, future at calvaryconnect.com and in the different ways that you can give. Why don't we pray and believe God for restoration. He's a good God. He's an awesome God. And I believe that the best is still yet to come. With every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're here today and you say, Alex, I don't know God, maybe you got invited and you're like, what the heck did I walk into? I know it's a family party today, but we love you and we're grateful that you're here. And our prayer is that you would become part of this family because God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. With every eye closed, every head bowed, if Dream Team could hold on just a second. If you're here today and you say, Alex, but I'm so far from God, I'm messed up. I've made some poor decisions. I broke through the painting of my life and, and I've been in failure. I'm gonna tell you today that failure is not final when Jesus is Lord and Savior. It's time to grow again. It's time to stand up again. It's time to believe again. All the things that God wants to do with your family, your household, your relationships. The Bible says that sin comes and sin 
comes to destroy each and every single one of us. Sin brings destruction, but Jesus brings healing. The Bible says that sin separates us from this holy, awesome God, but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. Today, if you're saying, I'm living in guilt, in shame, in sin, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. In other words, if you turn to Jesus, if you call on him, he'll forgive you. Just one moment, one decision, the rest of your life could be just an incredible blessing of all that God wants to do. Jesus died on a cross. He went down to a grave. He died for three days. He resurrected after the third. He's alive today. He's the only one that can change your life, fill your life, satisfy your life. Nothing else in this world can do it. If you've never made this decision or you walked away from God and you want to come back home today and say, I need God back in my life. With every eye closed, every head bowed, I would love to pray for you. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, if you say, Alex, I need Jesus. At the count of three, I want you to raise your hand high enough, long enough for me to see you. Then you can put it right back down. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but just here, if you're saying, Alex, I need it. Today, today, today's the day of salvation is what the Bible says. Today, I'm turning around. Today, I'm giving Jesus Lord and Savior of my life, my life, my soul, my mind. Today, I'm living for him. I want him to forgive me of everything I've done, the things that people know about and don't know about. At the count of three, you raise your hand, hold it up high enough and long enough, then put it right back down. One, two. Three, raise your hand all over this place. Raise it up, raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. All over this place, hands raised up everywhere. I see you, 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 I see you. Awesome, 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 awesome. Amazing, 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 awesome, awesome. You can put your hands back down all over the auditorium. Praise God. I'm gonna say a simple prayer. Repeat after me. In fact, the whole church out loud, repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. Today I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Jesus, I believe that you're my Lord and you're my Savior, that you died for me and on the third day you rose again. Come into my life from today on. I'm forgiven, I'm saved, and I'm healed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Hey, on the way out, I know we got photo booths and all that. Just, I know there's going to be some lines, but I know you, you're desperate. I need to go get my picture. I know we're about to go. But if you made that decision, we have a free gift for you outside. You're going to see those white bags all over the lobby in the front courtyard. Say, hey, I did that prayer with Alex. They're going to give you this free gift. There's a tons of gifts in there. The most important one is a free Bible from us to you. Get that Bible in your hands. It's going to be the best thing ever. Can you close us out in prayer? Absolutely, God. Let's we go. Thank you so much, Jesus. You, Jesus. We are humbled and so thank grateful, you, God. God, by your goodness thank and you, your faithfulness. God, as we stand living in our glory days, God, we thank you. We lift up your name God and we commit this new opportunity this new season to you God so you can continue to get the glory be in the middle of everything that we do father continue to be at the heart of who we are as a church God doing miracles and advancing your kingdom God we love you and we thank you in Jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. come on with every hand lifted let's sing this song out